Hello, everybody. This is Jeanne-Marie Pinel calling in from San Diego for the October 2017 uh, The Montessori Show. Welcome, everybody. Hi, Jean-Marie. Simone here from Amsterdam, from um, yeah, The Montessori Notebook. And yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you tonight. This is going to be a hot one. We have had so many questions come in. Uh, today's topic is sleeping, eating, and toileting. So they're all very tricky areas for getting kids' cooperation, but they can also, yeah, so the stuff that's uh, yeah, really good for the Montessori approach and applying it in practice. So before, <clears throat> before we get into the specifics of all your question, there is one thing that I want to make clear to everyone is that those three topics, food, sleep, and toileting, are really three things that we can never force our child to do, that we have very uh, little kind of, you know, uh, take on, like we can't control that. Not, not that we can control anything, but those are really three things that we really have very little control over. And I always like to remind parents that what we do have control over is the environment that we set up around these three topics, the, the routines that we establish around this, and really also the time and patience that we give to this. And so it's really about being our children's uh, guides or our children's coaches through these three stages or, or really, you know, things that, that really children are wanting to learn, are wanting to be independent around, and that we are there to guide them through it. So you know, I, I'm sorry to break the news to you that we have very little control over these three very, very important topics that uh, we tend to get really sometimes hung up over or that we're, we're stressing or, or, you know, concerned about. And just know that these are really, we're going to answer all your question and give you as much as support and encouragement, but it's really something that you do in partnership uh, with your child. Anything to add to that, Simone? Well, that was very interesting. I just lost my internet completely, so I didn't hear much of that at all, oh. except, to say, <laughs> except to say that I just got back online just in time for you to say anything to add. So, yeah, no, I do agree because we were talking before the show about how we have to, we do our work, we are very clear on what's expected. Um, but then we can leave the rest up to the child. So I definitely agree. And I think that there's some really great questions. So we don't really need to give too much of an introduction today. I think we'll get a lot. Maybe at the end, we can just hold five minutes to summarize in case we have kind of missed any of the key bits for each of the okay. areas. Okay. But um, I think we get to get stuck in because there's some really great questions here. Sound all right? Okay, okay. perfect. Yes. And welcome. Morvan's just called, joined the call from Scotland. And we've got um, people from India on the call and Leiden in um, the Netherlands and... From Michigan in the USA they're in the chat anyway but lots of other people are watching as well so welcome everyone all right so let's get started there's actually one question left over that we didn't get to from the last live show so we'll start there from little learning and that was how to deal with a preschooler who is not cooperating when you are tired and patience is almost gone when you the parent are tired um, I think so yeah yeah that's, so that's be the best you know, parent you can be <laughs> And that's, that's unfortunate, but, uh, you know, that's kind of the, the work that we need to do on ourselves of how can we uh, calm ourselves even when we are tired so that we are able to deal uh, with a little person who might not have as many tools in their uh, toolbox to be able to, to stay calm. So, you know, find for me, it's really have a conversation with yourself as to what is going to help you stay calm at the end of the day. It might be uh, asking for some extra help at the end of the day. It might be having a little moment of transition before you, you know, are with your child. If, if, and this is, this is, when I say transition, this is often something that I talk to with parents who are working maybe outside of the home and then going and picking up their child 
or you know coming home we all need moments of transition i you know parenting is our other full-time job and sometimes we need to transition from one to the other so it's about asking yourself what is it that is going to help me stay calm and 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 be there for my child who is also at the end of their rope. I mean, the, the end of the day is always a tricky one. We're all tired and we're all wanting to, you know, to get things done and, and have cooperation. So it's really about that that initial self-care that we, we always are reminding you that it's about looking at what you need to be able to be there for your child. Yeah. I mean, really also the, just making sure there's that connection in place. Um, beforehand because if you don't stop maybe read some books before you start to ask them to do yeah getting it's always dinner bath bed all these kind of things but so maybe exactly as you say kind of before you start all that make sure their tanks full their emotional tank and yours too I also remember we talked about this in another live show a long time ago and um, you and you suggested like take a cup of tea to the bathroom and make it nice for yourself while they're having the bath and that is meant to be a joy it's not meant to be something to get through to get to the end of the day like actually yeah as much as we can enjoy those things and also acknowledge I'm tired and you may be tired too so let's just go slowly let's do what we can do and, oh, you're having a real meltdown right now. Okay, let's just have a cuddle. And then and, and, that, and you bring up a really good point is that whole, you know, idea of filling up our connection tank. Like if, if that is also, you know, that's usually part of our self-care and the child self-care. So take a moment, have that, you know, in there where it's like, oh, let's, you know, have some cuddles before we go take the bath so that there's a real connection before we're we're you know again asking them to to do things and and also know that you know if you skip the bath once in a while it's everything's going to be fine <laughs> so give yourself a break too yeah. so we have we have a whole episode on getting cooperation as well so maybe i can link to that in the show notes because um to go through all the strategies right now is um, a bit difficult i know everyone's yes. like itching to get started on the sleeping and eating ones yes okay. yes so we're going to start with Jessica's question, and um, it's written in Dutch, so I'm translating for you guys. <laughs> but basically, she's very interested in the Montessori way um, of parenting children, and she has two girls who are one and four, and she was wondering um, how you can get your kids to like vegetables. Um, what do you do if one of them never seems hungry, and they feel she eats together and gives a good example, but it just doesn't seem to be working? So, so. Um so there's there's several several things there. One for liking vegetables. Uh, to me, this is all part of their exploration and and you know sensory all of this. To me, it's about always uh, offering these these foods. Um, I always you know with, with a meal, I always try to encourage that you always have something that you know that they really like that you know that they're they're going to eat, but always add in other things to to experience to taste. Um, I always like to set the example of that we always need to try it before we can say we don't like it. Um, and actually, it's funny because I just, um, I know some of you are listening to Be the Best Parent You Can Be uh, interview series these days, and we just had an expert who was specifically on food. And it's funny because I've always said that you needed to taste it before you could say you didn't like it. And she went uh, even a little further and said, even if you just smell it or touch it, or taste it like that that's your experience with that food like you have to experience something before you say you don't like it so i encourage to always offer these different uh, vegetables to show the example that you're eating them and know that children's nutritional plate is not in the 24 hour sequence like we tend to do for us adults where we always want to have you know all the the different balanced nutrition in our plate every day children do this on a whole week so it's really a seven day cycle so if they're eating only protein one day 
and you know only fiber the next day and only green vegetables the next day that's okay as long as they are taking that all that in as long as they're given the respect to listen to their body's needs and know that their body is wise and that they know what they need and also be reassured that they will never let themselves starve. So to me, make it a joyous occasion to have meals with them to, you know, as you were, you're saying, you already are having meals together, be there, use that as social, um, you know, part and, and just show that example. And, and I, I, it's coming up as I'm talking to you, um, my own experience as a young child, eating i was not a big eater at all i have made up for all of that now <laughs> but i was just not interested in food and i remember actually really not such nice experiences where i was kind of forced to finish everything that was on my plate or i was left alone in the kitchen to finish my dinner and all of that i encourage you not to do that because those are not fond memories um and and that you know I'm I'm healthy. I I I eat everything now. So just let let things be. Like, you know, again it's about setting up that environment. And then the other aspect of it that I would encourage is really have your child be involved in preparing the food, in choosing the food, in going to the market, in experiencing all of the things, in being intrigued by a new vegetable is like, oh, I wonder what we could do with that and taking them home and looking up a recipe and trying things so that they feel really connected to that experience and that they are involved. And I promise you that children who are actually involved in creating the meal in creating the will be a lot more likely to actually eat it and try it because they are so proud that they participated in it so those would be my my two big takeaways of that cool a couple of other things came up to mind for me as well that they need to try it and keep it being offered several times before they might even take it so i've even heard up to 20 times so just keep having it available in holland they also have rau course often available which is like a big plate of raw vegetables and everyone can just help themselves and i think that's nice because kids see you taking things and that can be a nice thing kids munch on it as the last bits of um dinner are being prepared. So that might be something that would work for them. Um, and also, do, are they the kind of children that like food apart on the plate? That's something that some children are really sensitive to. They don't like their pasta touching their vegetables, touching other things. And so maybe even like a bento box could actually be great for those kind of kids. And also not to overlook vegetables in sauces, for example. So um, a lot of my my children ate a lot of vegetables through like the pasta sauce that went on. It looked like a tomato sauce, but there was always some green things in there. and my kids aren't one of my kids wasn't super fond of mushrooms but they never noticed when it was in a sauce you know so they can get it other ways as well they don't have to just eat the whole stick of it yeah and then another thing about when i like the your idea of the bento box but also i like to really have everything on the table and and invite the children to serve themselves because also it's what they're going to put in their plate like you know they know how how hungry they are or or the ration as opposed to us serving them thinking like you know you need to eat all of this um i i would and or if you are going to serve them serve littler portions you it's it's better to serve them again and again than to put too much on their plate and then it ends up being something that they're going to want to experiment with and play with and explore and, and such so being being um, vigilant on the amount that's being put on their plate as well yeah and there's one other thing about the child who doesn't seem to eat anything did we um that's quite an interesting question and i think that sometimes it just requires some observation and some you know actually writing down what they actually eat because Sometimes it feels as if they're not eating anything, but everyone's got their own size stomach. And so I have one kid who eats anything you put in front of them, another who would forget to eat if you didn't remind them that it's mealtime and probably eats well two meals a day, like when they were smaller, now perfectly fine. But when they were having a growth spurt, 
you know, they couldn't get enough food. So they, we all have different sized stomachs. So it's hard to yeah, say. Yeah. And, and that's, and that, you know, that, that refers back to that whole week thing is like, be okay with them, you know, not being super hungry for a few days. And then like you say, when they have a growth spurt, they will eat a lot. And just, <clears throat> it's really about, you know, always having that environment of, of good, healthy foods. And then, you know, being also vigilant of how many snacks they're having in the day. I know there's some families that are grazing all day long. So, you know, when it comes to dinner time, well, they're not so hungry. So, you know, aware of that as well. So great, great points. Cool. Um, so we'll go on to Soledad. Um, her question is that her daughter will be one year old this Saturday and she's hoping to get a way for her to wash her hands independently as soon as she can walk on her own. How could I go about it? Thanks for your insight. So I guess this would be washing hands after eating and toileting or before eating. I remember. Oh, wait, or after. Yeah. So, so here again, it's really about the environment that we set up for them. Uh, there's different ways of doing the whole hand washing. There's, you know, a, um, a step stool up to the sink that you feel is safe uh, when they, they are working, uh, walking well. <clears throat> Otherwise, um, in Europe, uh, if you are in Europe, some of you are lucky to have bidets, which I think are just wonderful for uh, hand washing, which we don't have in the States. Uh, otherwise, it's really setting up a little hand washing station. And that really looks like the, um, you know, the bowl with a, a pitcher of water where they can, they can soap up and, and, and rinse their hands. So really different, different ways. And it really depends on the environment that you have and what you're, you're able to do. I've also seen these wonderful little sinks that uh, hook up on the side of a bathtub that I, for some reason, I can only find in uh, Europe. Um, and I'll, and I'll send you the link to that Simone, if you don't have it, but um, okay. so there's really different little, you know, environmental ways. And then it's about just incorporating that in the routine and you can start you know very early on about just this is just part of meal time this is part of toileting very important part of toileting to always incorporate uh hand washing in in any time that we go to the bathroom yeah i haven't got anything really to add there but perfect so yeah. our next one is from christine and she has a three-year-old um, who's starting school and no sign of interest in toileting at this stage. Um, he doesn't tell them when he goes. And if they ask him, um, particularly if he's, you know, have you dirty your nappy? He says he hasn't, um, even if they've smelt something. And um, at his preschool, they're suggesting putting him in pull-ups and getting him to sit on the toilet at every nappy change. But she's reluctant to try and push him when he doesn't seem ready um, he has older siblings who are both out of nappies after their second birthday, so she feels like he's quite late in comparison. So my um, my suggestion there would be, uh, for one, I I would kind of want to eliminate the the nappies or the diapers uh, at least during the day, and just and I I'm not crazy about pull ups because I feel that it is. Um, kind of confusing information where it feels like an underwear, but it's not really an underwear because you can still poop in it and all of that. So here would be really about, you know, having a, a conversation about, you know, using the toilet and, and he's seeing his older siblings, he knows where it is, and just really incorporating it very respectfully into the routine and using more of the cotton uh, underwear. Uh, there's some thick uh, training underwear that, that I really like where they don't, you know, leak right away. But at least the child is getting that mind-body connection of I have a sensation, I'm eliminating, ooh, this feels wet, it's not very comfortable, I want to go change it, and, and such like that. So important to to give him feedback because the the modern day diapers and, and, and nappies, as you call them, are done in such a way that they're extremely absorbent. And the child is not getting that that mind body connection. So 
it's it's about you know kind of again giving them the environment where they will have success so uh, you know just saying hey I, I there's no more diapers uh, today I, I uh, we, we have one for nap time and bedtime but during the day you know you can choose to wear an underwear or you know if you're okay with them going uh, without anything then fine and really helping them have knowing where to go having that all set up in your home yeah i definitely think the scaffolding skills would help a lot even though she feels like she's forcing him i don't think it would be it would just be oh we're going to start getting used to this idea and so when we change your nappy we can sit on the potty it doesn't it's all a way how you present it as opposed to now we have to sit on the potty that's not exactly. that's fun at all but if you're just curious about it and that's one of the things that they'll just learn to do and build into the routine i think that that's what i would do even with a younger child who's not interested in taking their nappy off the other thing if people are reluctant to move straight to cotton is um to put cotton under um, and cotton underpants first and then a nappy over and that's the same idea as they're starting to feel wet and things like that again so perhaps these diapers these days are very very good at keeping them so dry that when they pee and poop that's probably why he doesn't even notice because he's not feeling wet or he's not particularly sensitive exactly. and then the very last thing is to check that there's no physical reason why he isn't feeling wet you know um, or dry so maybe he might need to see a doctor if um, it's really a, a bowel yeah he's not sensitive to his bowel or something you don't know yeah. yeah, I don't yeah. think so. I mean, he's only he's only turning, he's just turned three, so that can. Yeah. Just and there's range. there's a great book that I often refer uh, families to is Diaper Free Before Three. So might be something that you you know you also uh, look into, but it's 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 right about that time. But they need our guidance. They they need our our coaching and the the pull ups. I think is giving them mixed messages. So being aware of that. Yeah, and I also, I mean, at three years old, there's no reason why she can't have a conversation and exactly solve it with them. Yeah, so that's really cool. Okay, this one's from Barbara, and I know Barbara. Hello, Barbara. She's moved to Portugal now, but they used to live in Amsterdam. And so they've been through a move, but that was already five months ago. Um, and Alice had just started using the toilet before they moved. And since the move, she's been refusing to go without a diaper when they're out of the house. But at home, she's... Um, dry, oh, she doesn't use the diaper, she just sleeps without the diaper and very rarely has, you know, doesn't make it to the bathroom. She says she hasn't pressured her about it and just gone along with her feelings. But now that she's quite settled at this kindergarten, um, is there anything she can do to encourage her to wear panties when they go out or at least to the kindergarten? She's going to be four in a couple of months and she, she thinks that the carers may be pressuring her a bit about it, even though she asked them not to. Um, yeah, so do you think how should she deal with the staff and yeah so i would definitely have a conversation with the staff that you you know you are aware of the situation and you don't want to pressure her but i would also think about just making the diapers that are no longer available like stop buying them you you know that she's capable of staying dry you know that she was was fine before and everything so it's almost like Oh, oh, we don't have any more, um, you know, and, and it's fine. Like she's, it's, it's again, it's about the environment and her getting used to it. So it, it sounds, you know, like the, the, you, the parent are also going to have to, to, you know, take a, a leap of faith and just stop buying the, the diapers and, and, you know, have them away so that it's an option. It's, it's an option of the, the, the blue underwear or the green underwear, but there are no diapers. So that would be, it sounds a little harsh, but I think it would also help her kind of not have that, uh, that crutch anymore because you know that she's capable. And, and I think needing to remind your daughter that you, you know, you know, you know that she can, she's, she's fine. And, and you've lived without diapers many, many days before. And we just, I forgot to buy any, oh my gosh, I forgot to buy some, you know, I'm sorry. And, and that's it. Yeah. I think that's quite interesting. I guess it's kind of being a confident leader on that one as well. And just reminding her, I mean, I don't want to not acknowledge her feelings, but it's like, oh, this is, might feel a bit scary at first, but I'm here and yeah, you're going to feel upset and maybe it's just a couple of rough days as she gets used to it, but you're that 
confident guide. As you say, it's not that she can't do it. So in a way, we're not really forcing her, but we're just trying to get her to take the next step and get her cooperation as much as possible in Like, oh, maybe next week we're going to, you know, I'm not buying the nappies anymore and um, we're going to save our money for something else instead of buying the nappies. So let's make a plan of what would make you feel most comfortable when we go over the house. Enjoy the nappies for the last four days that we've got left and, you know, then we'll have a goodbye nappy party and move on kind of thing. It doesn't have to even be manipulative. It can just be getting her involved in it. Oh, perfect timing, Barbara. She's just joined the call. I'm so, not sure if you... <laughs> not sure if she heard it, but it was basically to finish the diapers that you have at home and don't buy any new ones. And, and, and get and her involved in that process. With, exactly. Do this with your daughter. Alice has got this one. Okay, so go back and listen to that little bit, Barbara. Oh, and welcome, Anna, also from Amsterdam. Hello, all my little jacaranda tree families. Ah, ah, perfect timing. Anna's question's next. <laughs> okay, so toileting with a two-and-a-half-year-old boy. They started the process um, just by putting the potty in the bathroom and inviting her son to sit on it. Um, they always offer it to him, but sometimes he says he doesn't want to. And then after meals when he's playing in the living room, he doesn't want to come. And when he is using, like he can see them doing a bowel movement, they can see him doing a bowel movement, but he wants to keep playing. So he'll either refuse to go to the potty or take some toys with him, but they're kind of distracting him. So he doesn't bother being wet and dirty, even if he wears cotton training pants. He may announce poop or pee pee afterwards, but doesn't go to the toilet yet. And he's been, they're doing, been doing it seven months now. On, um, on the days at least when they're at home together, which is two days a week. And at the daycare, um, they're not using toilet pants at all. Um, so he's, but he's also in a phase of <laughs> resistance at the moment, changing diapers, getting dressed, undressed, isn't interested in dressing himself and undressing himself, which is difficult for independence. So she's now worried that she's too late and he's totally comfortable with being wet and dirty. So there's a big one. It is a big one. And you said that he was two? Two and a half. Two and a half. So it's still, you know, it's still young and it's and um and he is in that, you know, whole phase of, of individualization where he's realizing that he can say no and that he can uh push back and such. So it's really, you know, again about just having a routine. I would try to really take note as to when those bowel movements are happening because most often they tend to happen at the same time of day so that you can uh, invite him to go maybe during this time so there so there is success so there is this difference between uh, you know having the, the dirty underwear and then having to interrupt your play and such so really trying as much as possible when there's a moment of transition to use those moments to just make it part of the routine so it's not really an ask it's more of let's go to the bathroom uh, it's time to go to the bathroom and, and such so that there's a real uh, routine to when when he actually goes and then secondly uh, it's probably a little confusing for him that in the two environments that he lives in uh he's getting two di very different messages where you know at daycare he's uh still fine being in a in a diaper and then at home he isn't so you know that's something to maybe work with the daycare and to really speak to them that this is what you're trying at home and you know you would need their support for that um and then you know it's 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 patience it's uh it's respect he, he he'll get there um and he's you know he's not too old and it's not too late so it's really about just trusting the process and and helping him uh understand uh the difference and such and just making it as much as possible just part of the routine where you're maybe you know inviting him to go into the bathroom every hour at the beginning and especially if you're noting that the bowel movements are about the same time to really invite him to go uh, at those times. Yeah. And I also just think that like, for example, there's the fight at after meals when he's playing in the living room, you know, so maybe it's a process of like allowing that it's not going to be immediately after meals because he goes and plays or it has to, the routine has to be clear for him to know 
what's going to happen next. After meals, we take our plate to the kitchen, we go to the toilet, or we t take out what well, we we're allowed to play. And then when there's a moment of pause, and then you go. Also, the other thing that if he's resisting to come, you know, you could say, I, we're going to change your nappy or, or your diaper or whatever. And you just go and wait for them in the bathroom and toddlers need our help. So he's going to come and find you, but in his own time. So he's a kid who likes to do things in his own way. So I think that if she waited 10 minutes, he'll probably come find her. And mm -hmm. then it's not making him do it. Right, right. And, and, and I would encourage to maybe, you know, you say if they're, they're playing after dinner, I might <clears throat> encourage to really have that moment of, of toileting right after the meal so that it is part of the transition before he goes and gets involved and is, you know, focused in his play and then, of course, doesn't want to be interrupted. Yeah, I think that's true. And then getting dressed and undressed. It's again a routine thing, isn't it? And maybe giving him two choices and saying, I'm going to go and make myself a cup of tea and come back because he wants to get into a battle with you. And if you're not going to battle him, then it might be easier as well. And, um, and, and, and asking, you know, do you, do you need help? Would you like to try to put your pants on or you want mommy to help? And, and remembering sometimes that, you know, and I don't know like if he already knows how to get dressed or if he's had the, the, the practice, but they need a lot of practice for one to, to get dressed. And so making it an, an activity that can be repeated over and over through, throughout the day, like don't wait for it that it has to happen so that it's really is a, a, an activity of, you know, self-care of practicing and then sometimes, you know, with, with older children that you know that they can get dressed, sometimes they revert back to wanting help. And that's okay. That's just part of them wanting to have some extra time with you. That's, you know, a, an extra connection. I mean, you know, for, for myself, I always take the example, I know how to make dinner every night. And, and I do, I think I do a pretty good job of it. But some nights I really would like some help and I really don't want to be doing it. So it's okay also to to kind of go back and forth. It's not, they're not, you know, reverting back and they, you know, they will eventually get dressed all by themselves and will never ask for help. But right now they're still kind of going back and forth of uh, wanting that connection and wanting that extra support. And knowing this family, eh? Anna, I think that it's just being super clear and consistent. Yeah. So like if getting dressed is um, just, um, yeah, allow 10 minutes, don't allow an hour, like so that you're just moving forward. If he's not cooperating, okay, well then I'm going to help and we're moving forward as opposed to letting them run around and it takes an hour because otherwise we cross our limits as well and it doesn't give him consistency to know that's what's going to happen. Um, she asks as well, what about using toys and books while on the potty? She's worried that Montessori's against it. I've never, I've, I, I wouldn't know whether they were pro or against. To me, it's <clears throat> whatever works. I, I have a lot of families who have, you know, some books right next to the potty, and that's, uh, that's part of their, their way of, you know, getting the child to, to be able to sit still long enough to actually uh, have a bowel movement or, or, or urinate. So um, I think, you know, I think it's okay. There can also be music. Uh, I was actually talking to a mom yesterday about, you know, having a routine of some some deep breaths and, and being able to relax because sometimes uh, children are a little bit tense when they're, they're going to the bathroom. So really, like, you don't have to push. It's just your body you know, doing its elimination thing and, and, and to, you know, to have a routine of, of relaxing. So to me, sure, you know, you're not going to want to, you know, take all the toys in the bathroom and such and, you know, it, it being uh, not focused on the actual expectation. But I think a, a book or, or, you know, if they if they need a little buddy to go to the bathroom with, why not? I, I've personally, I don't know the pros and cons that that Montessori would would say. Um, do you have any take on that, Simone? I uh, yeah, I, I think it, officially probably they say not because it's toileting and it's got nothing to do with playing. But as you say, if it's helping, just get them comfortable. 
just don't keep it forever, you know, get them over the hurdle, get them using it regularly. And then gradually we need less and less dependence on that kind of thing. You're only worried about if they still need it to go with their five years old. So better to use it as a means to set those things up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's also fine. Very cool. And Petra says, oh, this is actually a question. Okay. I'll add that to my list. Okay. Moving on. We've got one from Anne. She is also from the Netherlands. And she says, when feeding a baby and the other child comes up to her face, I think that means the baby's face, to give her kisses, what might be a gentle thing to say? I can see you want to give your sister lovely kisses, but I'm not, I'm not sure whether to say she's eating and you prefer not to be interrupted or what will help her understand without lecturing her about personal space and respect as babies, uh, respecting baby's chance to eat. <laughs> Well, I mean, to me, it, it, the question would be more, is it really disrupting the baby from eating? Because, uh, you know, personally, it doesn't sound like it's, I think it's it's a pretty loving gesture. And, and, and I think it, it would be fine. I mean, if it if it's disrupting the infant or, or the, you know, the younger child from actually eating, then yes, you can, you know, definitely say, oh, I think she's, she's, you know, needing to, to concentrate on eating. She's, she's, you know, she's just learning how to eat. And maybe you can uh, give her a kiss when she's done, or, you know, give her a kiss on her hand or what, but I tend to not um, restrain loving affection, because it's such a beautiful sign from this older sibling to, uh, shower her younger sibling with love that I wouldn't want to discourage that. So, uh, you know, depending on the, 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 the extreme of the situation, I mean, if she's coming in and bothering and you're feeling like it's more of an attention getting from you, then maybe invite her to come sit on your side next to you and to watch the baby eating together or have, you know, she's might be asking for, for connection from you. So that would be something more for you to, 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 to tap into, like what, what is the, the actual message, but coming and giving a kiss while an infant is um, eating personally, I, I don't see any harm in that. Okay. And um, I also, I'm also going to look at the baby's response. So if they are crying, then I could say, oh, she's saying she doesn't like that. And doing that translating thing that we talk about a lot, yes. you know? Yes. So basically the baby's saying she's not enjoying that right now. Um, so I don't think you need to give a lecture about personal space and respecting a baby's chance to eat. I think that's too much information. Or you maybe you say it once at a neut more neutral time later. Oh, you know how, you know, you were giving the baby a kiss at lunch, particularly, I mean, it must be ongoing for her to ask. So you could then talk about it, not at that moment, but like it's not really helping her get to eat and I really wanted to eat and you really want to give her a kiss. How do you think we could work this out? Because I think that um, her daughter's getting to the age, she's two and a half, so she'd be able to come up with some fun ideas maybe. Oh, yeah, maybe I'll give her the kisses as soon as she's finished or while she's, you know, so we can just kind of also look at something like that as well. So right. hopefully that's not, um, that will come very easily. Then she's got another question. We have lots of times when... The little one of two and a half year olds wants to get up from the table. I know she's hungry and it's good she likes. I don't know what that meant. It's food she likes. Maybe. Oh, it's food she likes. Yes, it's just a typo. Thank you. I don't want to say if she doesn't eat now, that's the only chance. I wanted to eat then and there. We try to read stories to help her stay um, instead of any having any straps, you know, to hold her into place. Yeah. So this, it's kind of hard to know, like the age. Um, two and a half. Two and a half. Yeah, two and a half and not staying um, at the table. So for one, setting expectations before sitting down, making sure that you are sitting down and that you have everything on the table and that you're not getting up to go get something or such, that you're modeling eating with them. And... Um, I'm okay with saying, you know, uh, we're, we're eating now and this is dinner. And if you leave the table, you're telling me that you're done and, and, and moving on. I mean, there, there needs to be some sort of structure, some sort of information that is, uh, that she can trust you and that is concrete. So if you're, you know, preoccupied with her, 
uh, eating enough and that you're letting her get up and then you're giving her some more food later, again, those are mixed messages. So being really clear with how you want to go about it and there's no um, you know, wrong or right way of doing it. There's some families that, that graze all day. There's other families such as myself, there's three meals a day and that's it. Uh, you know, there, there might be for younger children, there might be a, a morning snack and an afternoon snack, but honestly, that's it. And that's really kind of what your family culture is around food, but, but be, be, be specific and know what your expectations are and, and stick to them and make sure that all the caregivers are on the same page so that she really starts understanding that there are certain times in the day where I nourish my body in a healthy way and, and I do it in community with my family and we're here together and, um, and we sit. And that's, that, would be, that would be kind of you know, what, I, what my personal take on it. Simone, do you have something? Yeah, to I'm really clear about getting down from the table as well. So I yeah. like what you say. Oh, when you get down from the table, that tells me that you're all done. Are you really all done? That's the chance. Okay, let me take our plate to the kitchen. If you do that three meals in a row, they get the rule that we sit at the table till we're finished. Two and a half is hard, and sometimes they might not finish their meal, but I wouldn't fill them up on snacks so that they really learn um, that that's what happens next. And, you know, it also will pay off because your baby will be seeing that we sit at the table. So it's really going to help the whole family meal. Yeah, and, and, and really this part is really a lot about us modeling and that's why to me it's really important to be thinking ahead of time of getting everything that you're going to need at the table or on a little cart next to the table so that you do not physically have to get up and go get anything because then again, you're modeling staying right there and, and having your meal It's so together. true. I think mothers get up from the um, – parents, sorry, not just All mothers. The time. Yes. All the time we get up from the table to get yeah. something from the fridge. Um, she'd like to eat her at a little table, but that would be alone. So I prefer her with us at the big table. At lunchtime, I sit with her, but don't eat at that time. And she eats her tea a lot earlier than we eat in the evening. But I try to eat something with her to share things. When friends come, they eat together at the little table and we try to eat all together at the weekends. I'm not sure I have the balance right. I think That's, it sounds okay. It sounds okay. I mean, to me, it's, you know, it's again, it's about routines and making sure that you, you're you consistent. So, you know, I, I really like what, and I know we've mentioned this on other shows, is the the high chairs that come to our table, such as uh, as the Trip Trap, which is the original one where, where the child is really sitting with us at the table and we can be with them, which is similar to, uh, you know, eating at their lower table. Or, you know, I know when my child, when my first one was um, younger, we actually did not have a dining room table. We all sat on the floor around the coffee table. And that was the way that we had our communal meal. It made it a lot easier for, for my little one because she had her, you know, little chair that she could just pull up there. And that's fine. So it's really what, you know, what works for you. Just be consistent is, I think, the, the most important part of it. Yeah, Anne just popped in the chat that she's, it's very true, she gets up and down like a yo-yo, and Kirsten says, I never thought about that, getting up to get something in the fridge is the same as wanting to go and play and come back, so yes, great it's point. It's all about modeling, it's they're watching our every move, so if mom and dad can get up and go places, why couldn't I? So yes, <laughs> very important. All right, next question is um, potty training. All good, except at the playgroup where they put nappies on her. So I think we covered this already. Um, it's kind of a confusing message to them. Yeah. Mixed messages, um, consistency for, for all of these. Consistency is key to all of this. So I'm just not sure why they put the nappies on. So I think I would just have a meeting with the teachers and just say she's getting a mixed message. We really want to move. How can we make that work for you? you know, because right. you want to appreciate they're probably just trying to save cleaning up pee off the floor. Yeah. But there has to be a... a, a and, and, and this conversation needs to happen not only with the play group, but also with the child that, you know, this is, 
that she doesn't have a nappy or a diaper on and, and, you know, to remember, let's go see where the bathroom is. I always like to, when we're in this phase of learning, I always like as when we're going to new places, when we're going to a friend's house, when we're going to a play group, uh, anywhere, I always go and explore. Oh, let's go see where the bathroom is so that there's this reassurance of, I know, you know, I know where to go if I need to so that we don't wait until you know they ask to go and then you don't even know where the bathroom is so even when you go to the supermarket oh let's go find out where the bathroom is before you even start your shopping so that right away we're reassured we know where things are yeah oh actually um, maybe i misread it it says all good except playgroup where they put nappies on and don't ask remind or say like we do time to use the toilet so there have been accidents so now I'm not sure if the nappies are on or not. Hmm. It says, I've explained what we do at home. They said my girl should first learn to use pull-up nappies. Yeah. So all right. Yeah. She's already in pants. No, so that's the same as the other question. Okay. Yeah. So. And then the last question from Anne is sleeping. Um, she's in conflict a little bit with her partner about it. She's keen to take the two-and-a-half-year-old out of the cot and make it a low bed but still using the cot as a frame as she can climb out now. He thinks she will get out lots as there's a new baby in the house and not sleeping as well. So I'm not clear, I'm not clear on what the, what the question was there. Sorry. All right. So, yeah, so I guess she's just wondering what to do. She has a two-and-a-half-year-old who's still in a cot. She wants to make it a low bed, but her partner doesn't want to because she's, he's worried she'll get out a lot um, as there's a new baby in the house and she's not sleeping as well. But it sounds like she's already getting out of the crib because she can climb out. Is that? Yeah. Okay. So I, I, would, <laughs> I would go with, with an easy way to get in and out. It's a lot less dangerous than, 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 you know, falling from trying to climb out of the crib. And yes, they, she is going to explore this new independence at first. And there will be, you know, a lot of bringing back. But Firmness and consistency of, you know, we, we need to stay in our bed and, and, and sleeping and such. And if she wants to go check on the baby, that's also part of, you know, an older sibling's responsibility and, and exploration. And I think that's fine. So it's about trusting the process, trusting the child is going to be able to understand that this is uh, where they sleep, but I would do it uh, the sooner the better, just so we don't have a child that gets hurt from trying to climb out of the crib. Yeah, and I think the thing I'm more concerned about is how you work with your partner, because you can't say, I'm right, so we need to go and change the code. Okay. But it's like, I think that she's ready, she's showing signs, you're not feeling comfortable, how can we make this work so that we can all be at ease, you know? So just keep communicating with each other and appreciating each other's view on things. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and just, you know, having um, actually in our last show where Simone uh, shared a lot about some nonviolent uh, communication might be a good one to, to rewatch too, because there is that communication with the partner of, you know, what is, what is our end goal for, for our child? And it's, it's to, to trust and to, you know, for her to have this independence and such. So how can we, how can we help her and, you know, offering her uh, a low bed where, and it can be, you know, it can even be a ritual of, of, you know, this is your, you're now an older sibling and you get to, you get to have a, a, a big bed and, you know, you don't need the crib anymore and so forth. So, so yeah. Yeah, I think that's good. And maybe it could be something like, well, that you ask your husband if you could just do it for two weeks um, and really see how it goes and that you're happy to be like on call for those two weeks and give it a really good shot at taking it away. And if it's really not working out, then I'm not sure. But yeah, at least that would might be an easy way to go rather than we're doing it and yeah, just ease it them in. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Lovely. Hopefully that helps Anne. Yes, Nappy's on a play group and they put them on. Yeah. Okay. So to have a chat to them. Again, yes. in a very non-communicate, non-violent communication way. Yes. <laughs> you can work with your crush as well. You've got I know that Anne watched last episode, so she's got lots of ideas, I'm sure, about that. Okay. Amanda sent in lots of questions about sleeping, which is a really good one. 
Um, she has a boy who will be four in December and a girl who just turned two months old. Um, her question is that neither of them will fall asleep alone. Most often, not always, they wake in the middle of the night and lay with them until they fall back to sleep and it's exhausting. She says, she, A, she realizes it's her fault and B, which method would you recommend to help them at this age? She's heard the no cry sleep solution is a slow and gentle method. Any comments? So should we start with that one? Sure. So for me, this is, I think you, you, you know, I mean, this parent knows already that it is habits that were, that were created, that were formed. So now it's going to be about changing those little habits and having some new routines and such. So it's really setting up from the beginning, what are your expectations? Uh, and I would involve the children in this. I mean, I think this is really important to to have uh, a family meeting around this of, you know, this understanding that we sleep through the night and when it's dark out, we all sleep and we stay in our beds and, you know, depending, I don't know what the sleeping arrangements are, but that, you know, we're, we're going to help everybody in the house get a good night's sleep because sleep is very important for everybody's health. Uh, it makes mommy in a much, much better mood. It makes daddy in a much better mood and, and such. And really starting to put in place um, a routine where they can start really self-soothing and being able to get to sleep um, on their own. So I always recommend really simple as simple as possible routines because again as you've seen once we start forming habits it's it's hard to get ourselves out of it so you know i know in in one episode we talked about actually creating like a a, a routine chart and this might be something that you could do with both children of you know what it is that they need to be able to go to sleep and 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 have a good night's sleep and so maybe revisiting that and and you know taking photos of them doing all of that and trusting that again it's going to be about the consistency that you that you offer and such and that when they do wake up in the night is again setting the expectations from the beginning. So really setting the expectations when you put them down of letting them know if you wake up during the night, um, I will come in and give you a little, you know, rub on your back and then I'm going to go back to bed. So that they know ahead of time what it is to expect as opposed to you coming in Pro, you know, laying down, waiting until they go back to sleep, until and then you have to get up and go back in your bed, and it's it's exhausting. It is exhausting. So, you know, again, having those expectations and really simple little uh, gives that you're going that you're going to do, and also getting the uh, parenting partner to to help out, like taking turns. I think it's really really important that we fill up our own sleep tank before we attempt any big changes before we attempt any big habit moves so you know if you need your uh somebody else's help for a few nights to just get as much sleep as you possibly can so that when you're when you're ready to start changing habits you're already uh better prepared for it yeah um, I definitely think the consistency is a big part of the sleep thing. Um, and the sleep crutch thing is really interesting too. There's a good book called Good Night Sleep Tight by Kim West that um, I've read. And it really talks about that. And it was explained to me the best way because my son used to fall asleep at the breast as well. And they're like, okay, when you turn over in your sleep, because everyone does, we go into light sleep. We usually settle straight back to sleep without even knowing we've woken up. But if your pillow's fallen off your bed, then you wake up. So if you're always sitting by the bed, that for your four-year-old will be, oh, mum's not there, so it freaks me out. Um, yeah. So um, if she doesn't want to, you know, gradually remove herself, there's also like a, a, the, this book talks away, if they call it, I can't remember the method she calls it, but basically it's having the um, chair by the bed 
And then after a couple of days, the chair moves a little bit further and then the chair moves a little bit further and then you're sitting at the door where they can still see you and then it kind of by then you're gradually getting used to the idea. So yes. um, I remember that when um, I used to do a babysitting swap with another family, so they'd come and babysit my kids one week and, and then once a month I'd go to their house and do the same. And um, their kids were still having their mum help them get to sleep. And I was a bit like, well, this is going to be a bit tricky. They're four and five and I'm not their mum, but I'm happy to sit in a chair for a little while until they fall asleep. And then gradually over a couple of months, I didn't need to sit in the chair anymore. So it's also possible. And then she said that that was probably the thing that turned was the turning point for them as well. And it's just because I was super clear. They'd start to try and want to talk to me. I'm like, oh, I'm reading my book. You know, exactly. I'm reading my book. Yeah. Because you kind of wear clothes now. <laughs> Everyone's got their limit. So that yeah. might help. Yeah. Not um, very important. She said, if I were to have another child, both my babies were very clingy and she understands you're not meant to nurse them to sleep, but it's hard. Um, it becomes a habit. How do you break that habit and how do you not start in the first place? Um, they weren't very content as babies to lie down and watch me do my work, whether in the kitchen or in the living room or in the bathroom or wherever. So um, I think these actually are really good questions because um, it is all to do with sleep habits. Yeah. Do you yeah. want to answer first? No, it's 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 about the the uh, what some sleep coaches call sleep shaping, which is you know again those habits that we start from the very beginning, and and you know the whole nursing to sleep is is a tough one because it is so much easier <laughs> to do. You know they 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 they're falling asleep on the breast, or we can lay them down. But exactly like Simone was saying, is that a child who has fallen asleep on the breast is in the warmth of your arms. And that's where they have uh, consciously fallen asleep. That's where they're aware that they're falling asleep. And then you take them off the breath, breast, they're, they're asleep, you put them on a bed, and you walk away. They wake up, they're completely disoriented. They, they're, they're, they're not in their mother's arms. It's a different place. And they are, they're woken up completely because it's so different. So the habit to try to have from the beginning is when you see them doze off, so they're not completely doze off, they're still like semi-conscious, you, you take them off the breast and you put them down and you tell them, you're rested, you're falling asleep, I love you, and I'll, you know, I'll see you later. And, and, they're, and they're, they're falling asleep themselves in the area where they will eventually wake up and we all go through these, you know, waves of deep sleep, and then we 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 wake up, but we're reassured because we're in the same place. Um, actually, I think it is Kim West who was talking about, you know, being uh, falling asleep on the couch, for example, fully dressed, and then you wake up and you're in your bed in your in your pajamas. It's like you're you're completely startled because it's like, how did I get here, right? So it's the same thing with the child. It's really that sleep shaping from the very, very beginning and keeping those routines as simple as possible so that they don't end up um, equating falling asleep with, with breastfeeding so that, it, that that crutch, that habit isn't formed from the very beginning. Cool. Um, I think that covers most of it, huh? Um, I think also the reason that they don't, they were clingy and they don't lie her, lie down to watch her work, I think it all is related to generally not sleeping well. Once you get into this, I don't think it has to be a schedule, but I do think a rhythm of like the child wakes, then they, they feed and then they play and then they sleep. Then that routine is really important because then they know what to expect and then they actually don't fall asleep on the breast so much because they're actually hungry when they wake up from their nap and i know that i went through i've actually got an article on my blog i can link to it about all the mistakes i made with my first one and how i did it and learn from those with my second one because i was like i'm not going to have him fall asleep on i'm not going to have my daughter fall asleep on the breast and how am i going to make that happen and just by having when she woke up she ate and then she um played and then she went to sleep sorry i'm not very coherent i'm quite tired <laughs> Um, then, uh, yeah, it, it just, it, she just it was a great sleeper. And I was so much more clear and I didn't think, oh, maybe she's still hungry. That's why she's not getting to sleep. It's like, oh, I'm just going to support her as much as she needs to. Sometimes I needed to, you know, sit by her. But a lot of the time 
she just she was she had the really sleep association this is my bed i'm going to sleep now so yeah yeah no very it's much clearer for her yeah and the and the and the also just to to pick up on the idea that they're not content uh you know watching you sometimes it's uh uh this is where baby wearing is so so nice because you can actually have your child close to you you are doing the things that you need to do your your arms are free you can talk to them you can let them know what you're doing and they're they at first they just need that connection it's not you know clingy is not i don't like to 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 that term because it sounds almost like it, it's a negative thing it's just they need they need attachment this is part of them establishing that security so you know there there's there's nothing wrong with with that need it's just sometimes how can i still get things done and and also um, you know, be there for them. So the, the whole uh, baby wearing sometimes, I know I did that a lot just to get things done around the home and, and, it, and it worked great. Um, if you've got a bit more time, um, Jean-Marie, we've got maybe short ones, but three or four more little ones, yeah? Okay, okay? And, and there's one that I just wanted to, uh, Teresa from uh, Czech Republic also put something in the, chat that I just wanted to touch upon because she asked about if we have any experience with premature babies. Oh yeah, that's okay. Um, yeah, we can do and that some one specifics now. about toilet training and weaning. Um, Teresa, I don't, you know, specifically uh, have experience with uh, premature babies. The only thing that I know that is important is to really think of the kind of the developmental window as what the actual due date um, was so that you're you're more connecting on that than the actual birth date so that you're not um, you know thinking that they're 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 behind and such and that and then you know I don't know the the you know how your your children are evolving and such but it's just every child is different every child is different whether they're born at term or premature or such and it's really about just being in tune with their specific needs um so you know just just really follow follow the child um there cool um alexandra had a question which is over here let me quickly have a look oh i just lost it it says my email has been very slow. Hi, my name is Alexandra. I have a question about sleeping. My daughter is 3.7 years old. She still sleeps in our bedroom, but in her separate bed because we moved a lot and all of us were never ready to sleep in different bedrooms. With every move and every in a new place of living, she needed some time to settle down and then we move again. But we are about to move to our new permanent house and we really, really wanted to sleep in a separate room. We expect a lot of resistance from her and wanted to ask your advice on what gentle strategies we can use to achieve independent sleeping. Thank you very much. So if you're if you haven't moved into the new place yet, is that they're they're about to move or they Yeah, they're moved. about to move. So they're about to move. So this is perfect timing to set up an environment in this new home that is going to be hers. Um and just really making sure that she knows this is for her. If you're not ready yet, you're also, you know, giving giving different messages. So be clear on what your your intentions and your expectations are. But I would really make a big deal about, you know, having your own room and your bed. And, you know, making sure that she knows that she can always come and cuddle and, and, and have that connection and just start that routine. Use this new opportunity, especially if you know you're not going to be moving, um, as the opportunity to, to create this new space for her to, to sleep. Uh, she is completely, you know, capable and you can definitely have a routine where you, you know, have a little bit of time with her in her room. Um, it is always advised that all of the uh, sleep routines and the calming down happen 
in the area where the child is expected to sleep. So make sure that your uh, routine at the end of the day where you're uh, you know, preparing them to, to go to bed and everything does happen in her room so that it, there's just comfort in that as well. Cool. And Janaki has just left the course. She was in India and it was already past um, midnight. Oh <laughs> but she asked, at what age does a child start eating on their own? But I think it's still worth putting on the call because we'll send her through the replay. Everyone will get a replay at the end of the call. <clears throat> so this is um, a touchy subject for, for some because there's uh, different trains of thoughts. But to me, it's really, again, about following the child. So when the child is starting to follow your food and starting to drool and have their mouth open and just so you know you can see that they're just so intrigued I think it's really good to start offering the sensorial experience of food and this typically happens around five six months sometimes earlier sometimes later um, and then start you know start that whole experience and this is not, <clears throat> in Montessori, we, we, we talk about weaning. And when we talk about weaning, it is not about stopping the breastfeeding. It is just about the introduction of solid food. So it's really when they are uh, starting to sit well on their own, uh, that they look really interested, that they're starting to... Um, you know, drool and, and sometimes a, a tooth has come out. This is all a perfect time to start introducing the sensorial experience of solid foods. Yeah, and I think that um, I really like the baby led weaning approach. I think that that's really p fits quite well with the Montessori approach because the children are bringing things to their own mouth rather than having this spoon come to you. Here, Jean Marie, do you want this spoon in your face? Um, mm -hmm. You know, and they can they can really go at their own pace. So then it means having vegetables that are quite well cooked that they can put in their hand and kind of gnaw off and again experiencing the food they're holding them in their hand or having a bit of a, a breadstick or a piece of bread in their hand. I think that works really well as well. Now the mm -hmm. thing is, is there's beautiful videos you can find on YouTube of um, an eight-month-old sitting on a little weaning table and the dad puts um, some chicken on a little tiny piece of chicken onto a fork and leaves the fork in front of them for them to do at their own pace and then the baby just brings the fork to their mouth. So forks are a really good place to start. Um, learning to feed themselves because spoons obviously it depends which way you're holding it up and then when you want to move to a spoon have something thick like a porridge or an oatmeal kind of that do you call it oatmeal yes we call it I call it porridge but <laughs> I think it's oatmeal in, in the states um, something like that so it's a bit thicker so it's a little bit easier to get into their mouth so yeah we start quite young with children feeding themselves because yeah also with glass a little glass they can bring to their mouth quite easily and just put in a teeny weeny bit of water enough that you're happy yeah mm -hmm, you, mm -hmm. but it's really it's really following their lead like if you're observing them you will see they will want to start grabbing things uh, they're they're interested in foods and I think it's important to to follow their leads there Okay, then um, I have a question from Morven. Okay, she's on the train, I think. <laughs> so um, it says something about dealing with a four-year-old who's waking through the night after dreaming. I want to deal with calmly and gently. I would, I mean, if you, if it's, if it's uh, <clears throat> dreams, I mean, sometimes they go through uh, spurts of having, you know, um, even even kind of hard dreams that are waking them up, that are scaring them. It's important to to just comfort them, to just hold them. Um, you know, this too shall pass. It's 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 part of it. I mean, I still go through periods where I'm woken up by by you know stressful dreams or whatever. Okay, I put myself back to sleep, but but for a younger child that might be harder so you know it's okay to reassure them um i know i had at one point my little one would come in because they you know he had had a dream and i would just give him a hug and, and walk him back to his bed and just you know be there to reassure um it's 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 not something that they really control so i think it's really hard to you know to to be strict about it it's just it's something that is they're processing i mean the dreams are are what we're processing that we are 
learning or that we've experienced uh, throughout the day. Yeah. Um, I think also what's kind of interesting as well is when we moved to Amsterdam, the um, place that we were renting had a mattress on the floor in our bedroom that was the only guest bed. And sometimes we would just have it made up with a duvet on it. And sometimes we'd wake up in the morning and there was a kid in there and they'd had a bad dream. So this was actually a really good solution. They didn't abuse it because they really only used it if they were sick or that kind of thing, but they just didn't feel lonely. And what was great was it didn't wake us up either. So completely by accident, we had this really nice um, solution to that as well. So maybe that's something that might help. And also at that age, you can you can talk about it. You know, you can you can ask like, what would help you? How can I help you? I've noticed that you've been waking up, and these you know these stories are coming into your head. And and what would make you feel good? And maybe you know, you'll be surprised sometimes the solutions that our children uh, come up with. Yeah, it might be that they want to put all of their teddy bears along the wall or there's some books or anything. Yeah, it's great. Yes. yes. Okay, we have two more. Okay, last ones. Okay. Pe Petra from Vienna in Austria. Hello. She says she's recently started implementing cooking on Mondays with her students and they really enjoy the process. We try to follow easy recipes that enable the children to be as independent as possible. We try to use seasonal fruits and vegetables. What do I do when I'm approached by a parent asking to help with cooking on Mondays and suggesting pizza or fast food? <laughs> uh, parents need to be educated here. <laughs> um, so from what I'm understanding, the parents want to come in and help, but they're bringing in fast food. Is this what? <laughs> I think that's it's not a choice yeah. that she wants, basically. Yeah, no, I, I, I think I think it's just this is part of parent education and that you need to really be firm and kind and loving and diplomatic with these parents that this is it's it's the process of the actual cooking that is important. It's the satisfaction of making things ourselves. Um, <clears throat> it's the it's, you know, cooking healthy foods and learning about the different foods and where they come from and such. So it's really, it's, it's the process that is so important here. It is not the outcome. It is not about the, the actual feeding. It is the, the whole sequence of, of um, the experience of preparing something that is just uh, so important. So um, I would you know, sometimes parents are maybe shouldn't be invited into the classroom uh, during those days if they aren't uh, <clears throat> on the same page. And, and to me, that's okay. I mean, I had, when I first worked in the classroom, I was with three to six year olds. And the first year I really wanted to please all the parents and they wanted to come in and do all these activities. And it just became way too overwhelming for for the parents for the children for myself that I just put a stop to it and the next year there were just very specific days uh, where parents were you know were able to be in the environment but you know I think you you are the curator of that environment and and you just need to be firm and kind with the parents yeah and I think that pizza's not in intrinsically bad they can make the dough from scratch they could use spelt flour they can have very simple healthy toppings so mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be that pizza is a really bad food it's not deep fried if we're making it with the kids and actually i love making pizza dough with the kids so or dough balls or something like that so maybe it's a way of oh i won't don't i don't want to have um pizza brought in from the store but we could definitely try and make some a healthy version for the children here we're teaching them about what's healthy for their bodies and so that's why we're choosing rather than pre-prepared fast food um the process of learning to cook uh, you know, that's yeah. all you need to really say and yeah. they'll, they'll find it really fascinating hopefully and they'll yeah. want to do more of that at home and this is an example of how you can do it at home yeah and, and really i see there's a, i see there's a question here from uh, kirsten who's actually oh, okay, just a minute before she's sneaking in first though there's one before oh, okay okay one second. Okay, so Jacqueline asked, how do you demonstrate you are upset with the behavior? We took away, oh, my screen's not big enough. We took away diapers, and when she has an accident, she just points and says, pee pee carpet, or we'll ask for a carrot, chew it, and spit it out onto the floor. So what, what, is, what was the question? How do you demonstrate you're upset with behavior? With, with firmness and kindness, I... I, I 
I mean, the, <clears throat> the, 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 the pee pee and all that, I actually invite the children to help clean up because it's just, oh, there's, there's a spill. We need to clean it up so that it becomes, it's nothing, you know, I don't want to punish them or shame them. It's just, this is part of the process. Um, and then the, the, the carrot spinning out, that's, you know, again, like, oh, you didn't really want a carrot, huh? And you just take it away and, and, and be firm with, with what is going on. I always like the I messages also when I'm upset about something of you're really, I can't let that happen or, you know, it's instead of you're bad or you can't do that because it's obvious that they are doing it. So it's really always about, I can't let you do something. Yeah. No, I think that's clear. <clears throat> that's good. We're keeping them short. Do you want to answer the question? I officially closed questions, but it's good. Okay. It's going to yes, no, because I know Kirsten's here in San Diego. So thank ah, you perfect. for being on the call. Uh, she was asking about a shared bedroom. So um, I it says like... That she's got the nighttime routines with both is very difficult. And the four and a half year old wants to read and the toddler sits still a little bit, but then wanders off. So at the moment they're kind of... Um, her husband's doing one and she's doing the other divide and conquer. And they are, well, I would start, you know, really trying to, <clears throat> first of all, again, having a conversation with the entire family about what the expectations are, what the routine are. And these habits are, you know, slowly going to need to shift. And if the older one, you know, wants a story and the toddler wanders off, it's okay for a little bit as long as maybe they stay in the confine of the room, uh, especially if you're wanting to do a shared bedroom, which I actually recommend from the very beginning because it just alleviates a lot of these different transitions. Like I, you know, with, with expecting parents, I always encourage to set up the, you know, the baby's room in the older sibling's room from the beginning. But now that you're, you know, wanting to to transfer them is really have a plan together of how this is going to work and that you notice that, you know, the older son wants a book and the younger one isn't all that interested at first. <clears throat> and that's okay, you know, that maybe have something that they can do calmly while you're reading, uh, while you're reading the story out loud. And just that is just going to become part of the routine uh, for everybody. And then everybody gets into their bed and good night kiss and we turn off the light and we walk away and we love you. Yeah. And it, there is always a transition period when you do all of a sudden have two kids in a room because they get, it's a novelty. Oh, look, there's someone else to play with and that kind of thing. I mean, I even there were times when I put my younger one to bed and she fell asleep before the older one. So that might be something to kind of think about at the beginning maybe is that the toddler's already asleep before the four-and-a-half-year-old. They get to stay up for a little bit just at least for the transition period. They start to get used to each other in the same room and they're waking up and, yeah. There's going to be different things, like they'll wake each other up in the morning, but what's going to be your rule? Like, oh, do they stay in their room? Like, how does that work? If you wake up, are you quiet? Particularly for the older ones, probably got more control over that. The younger one will just want to yes. play. Um, yes. But what they could do. So that's kind of something you could think about. Yeah. Yes. Well, wonderful. I hope, we, hope we've answered all of your questions. I know we went a little bit over time, but... We did get uh, to all of them. Um, there was one from Anna, but we answered it in the chat. And so everyone said, thank you very much. Um, Anne said, thank you very much for tonight and helping us all sleep tight. Uh, Barbara said, thank you very much for the advice. Great show. And um, we had, yeah, Janaki sign off earlier. Janaki sign off earlier. She <coughs> said that she said you are both... Awesome, doing a great job. <laughs> She's going to bed. All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Um, night to everyone. Oh, did you want to um, share, is the Be Your the Best Parent You Can Be still running? It is. So if you are interested in, in Simone, maybe I, I'll share the link with you um, for the email you sent out. Be the Best Parent You Can Be is still going until Wednesday. And then after that, there will be a replay period where I will share all 24 interviews. It has been awesome. There has been some really uh, wonderful interviews. I've been getting a lot of great feedback of how 
peaceful and much calmer uh, parents are feeling uh, with their little ones. So mission accomplished. Uh, and if you want to join, it's be the best parent you can be dot com. Uh, and you will be asked to enter your uh, name and email, and then you will start receiving whatever um, interview is going live that next morning. So hope you can join me there as well. Great. And Catherine has just quickly asked, when is the next one? Well, I'm new to the live show and can't wait. Um, Catherine, we do them once a month, and we will send everyone who's on the mailing list um, a, an update the week before saying that we're going live. I'll send it actually out the date of the next call also in the replay that's going out. Sean Marie and I just have to um, check our calendars. Is that right? I, I think we have it on for the 24th of November. So probably uh, the 24th of November, we'll confirm that. But we will confirm because I know in the US that's uh, Thanksgiving weekend. So we'll, oh, we'll, yeah, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll definitely let you know. But it's, it's always once a month. Um, and if you uh, subscribe, you get uh, the emails from Simone. Okay, perfect. And Anka, you're welcome. Thank you for joining. She said she loves the not in always in the mood for cooking example. That really is a shift of perspective. I can hardly wait to share it with my husband as well. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Cool. All right. Night, Bye. night, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.